So I want to I want to take a moment here to introduce Travis Booms, who's got who is our speaker tonight. And Travis is a um, he's a regional wildlife biologist for the Fish and Game Threatened and Endangered and Diversity Program, conducting research in central, western, and northern Alaska. He primarily focuses on raptors and shorebirds. He's all. He's also involved in several avian research groups, and he's a Northern and Western Alaska falconry representative for fish and game. Uh, Travis has a BS in biology and wildlife management from University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, a master's degree in raptor biology from Boise State University, and a PhD from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where he re researched um, the breeding biology of jeer falcons. So that's a lot of degrees, Travis. Um, it's gonna, I'm excited to see this talk. I've missed the last time that he gave this around here and I'm excited to see this. And with that, I'm just gonna hand it over to you, Travis, to share screens and take it away. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, can you see my sli opening slide? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, so thank you all for joining us uh, this evening. I hope this finds all of you doing well. Uh, I am, yeah, I look forward to giving this talk uh, because I wear two hats in it. And the first one is a personal hat uh, that identify as a lifelong hunter. Um, and so uh, I get to talk a little bit about my personal experiences growing up in a hunting family. And my first memory of hunting really is when my father here, uh, shown in this place, orange jacket, drove our 1970s red Valari home with a big buck in the back of it. I'm originally from Wisconsin, and I grew up in northeast Wisconsin. And I have a very vivid memory of this evening. I was really excited to see this big deer. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm speaking to you tonight, first as a lifelong hunter, but then secondarily, later on in life, I became a, a wildlife biologist uh, and happened to focus a lot of work on uh, raptors. And then uh, more recently, specifically on golden eagles. So I have perhaps a unique perspective to share with you tonight about uh, eagles and and lead. So wearing my ADFNG research biologist hat, uh, last winter I was a co-author on a publication that came out in a fairly prestigious journal, Science, talking about the demographic implications of lead poisoning in eagles in North America. And more than any other scientific paper that I've been involved with, this one got a lot of press. Time, Nat Geo, NBC News, US News picked it up. And they all grabbed the headline of one of our primary results is that about half of eagles across the US, including Alaska, we found were chronically exposed to lead, meaning that they are exposed to lead repeatedly throughout their life. And this is a, was a pretty eye-opening statistic, I think, even for a lot of us biologist types that were somewhat familiar with this issue. So in the process of participating in this study, my coworker, Chris Barger, who's here in the Fairbanks office and is an integral part of all the projects that I work on, uh, him and I had a more focused question about how prevalent is lead in Alaska's golden eagles? And then what is its source? Where is it coming from? And we were able to do this uh, through two different studies, the biggest one of which was putting satellite transmitters on adult golden eagles. Here you can see Chris um, holding a, a large bird uh, that is very much alive. We put a hood on it and raptors calm way down once you put a hood on it on their head. And we just uh, harnessed this bird of the satellite transmitter and we were gonna let it go here shortly. In the lower right corner, you can see a couple of vials of blood. And uh, it's fairly common practice when you get your hands on a bird to draw blood. And we we're able to use this blood in a study looking at these birds. And then also another sample of golden eagles nestlings in Western Alaska. So we collected blood from adults and subadults in South Central Alaska at basically Gunsight Mountain on spring migration. And then we also collected samples from chicks uh, nestlings in the summer from the Seward Peninsula. <clears throat> so we basically collected samples from three life stages of golden eagles. Uh, first one being nestlings, so less than 12 weeks of age. The second one being subadults, uh, eagles go through a delayed maturation process where they don't become sexually mature until about five years of age. And you can identify them and age them based on the white plumage in their tail and their wings, as you can see in this photo. 
And then after about five years of, of age, they become sexually mature and can enter the breeding population. Of course, there's exceptions to all of those rules, but generally speaking, uh, so we collected samples from these three categories of eagles. We collected blood from the wing vein and sent it off to a lab. Before I get into the results, I want to talk about a couple of different ways that you can measure lead in eagles and other organisms and how we will talk about our results. Uh, so we used blood in this study, in this Alaska specific study, and that provides you a pretty good idea of lead exposure over the past month or so. Now, the science paper, we also used uh, bone samples um, to give us a better understanding of lifetime exposure because lead is ultimately deposited in the bones of animals. So, of course, with the satellite telemetry study and the nesting study, we weren't going to uh, euthanize any of, our, any of our birds. So we did not use bone for our samples. So we didn't collect uh, lifetime exposure, but rather acute exposure uh, through blood samples. So before I get into the results, let's look at what we might expect. So base, because of in broad-based environmental low-level contamination, we expect to find some small amount of lead in most animals. And that's what we call a background level to about one point, about one part per million. Anything from about two parts to six parts per million, we consider that lead poisoning. Uh, where you oftentimes see sublethal effects uh, in animals. And then in eagles, above 0.6 parts per million, we consider that as potentially lethal levels where the lead accumulation in the blood in the body itself could cause death to that eagle. Now, <clears throat> we're not only concerned about lethal uh, levels of lead, but also actually in many regards, more concerned about sublethal effects because Lead affects almost every system in the body of an animal, uh, and it can cause seizures, blindness, vomiting, a loss of balance, weakness, organ function. Uh, it can affect reproduction, immune function, and mental function, um, or immune response, sorry. Uh, and so <clears throat> we're curious to see kind of where our eagles in Alaska land on this. So. Now I'm placing the results of our samples of the three different categories on the screen. And you can see right away that we didn't find any nestings with what we would consider lead poisoning. They all had background levels of lead, which is pretty much what we had expected. What was more interesting and a bit concerning is that 16% of adults and subadults uh, we found had levels that were consistent with lead poisoning. And two of them were at, or one was quite a bit above what is a oftentimes considered potentially lethal levels of lead in their blood. Um, so that was a, a pretty alarming statistic, but it also fits in with what we found in the, in the science paper where over the lifetime of eagles, they're being repeatedly exposed. Um, and we're seeing that in when we do look at uh, bone samples of eagles. Okay, so where is this lead coming from? Uh, again, here you can see the three categories uh, of birds, adults, subadults, and nestlings in the center of the, of, the, uh, of the slide. And on the vertical axis, I have uh, lead isotope ratio. So you can think of that as these unique molecular signatures of lead so that we can kind of track um, where the different types of lead, if you will, come from. And so now I'm showing that uh, the molecular signature of lead paint in the upper right corner is pretty similar to what we found in the molecular signatures of lead in the lead that we found in the nestlings. Um, we did not find uh, lead in the blood of any of the birds that were similar to the molecular signature of lead smelting. What we did find um, is that uh, the molecular signature of rifle ammunition is very similar to that of the lead that we found in adult and subadult eagles. So this is pretty strong evidence that we pretty confidently can say where this lead in adult and subadult eagles is coming from, and that's from rifle ammunition. If we just look at temporal evidence of where the lead is coming from in eagles and other uh, carcass scavengers, there's a really good paper out uh, published in 2008, uh, where they uh, went out and collected uh, blood from ravens as a proxy for other scavengers, including golden eagles, um, on the landscape. And they did that starting in November 2004, and they did it every month 
until March of 2005. And what they found is that you, there was distinct seasons when there was peaks in lead levels in the blood of ravens. And for all of the hunters out here, it's pretty obvious to see uh, why there's or what season is being overlapped with uh, high levels of lead. And we saw those uh, overlap, uh, those spikes in lead occur during and shortly after the big game hunting seasons in the area in which the ravens have been sampled. So this is pretty clear temporal evidence that in fact, these the birds that scavenge on the carcasses are getting it during the big game season. And remember that the lead in blood stays in blood for about a month. So there's a little bit of a delay there as well, which you can see at the end of December, January, as the blood levels again taper off after the hunting season. So it's pretty clear that based on all the lines of evidence, we can be pretty confident in knowing where the lead is coming from. Um, and that's from lead ammunition, lead bullets that us as hunters use. And lead is really good at harvesting an animal, uh, partly because it does fragment and kills the animal quickly. This is an x-ray of an animal uh, that was harvested with a lead bullet and all the little white specks you can see in the kind of the center right part of the x-ray. Those are all little pieces of lead from the one bullet that this, an that this animal was shot with. And so lead bullets uh, retain anywhere from 60 to 85% of the original weight. And so when they're shot into an animal or into a ballistic gel, as this x-ray shows here, they lose little pieces of lead uh, as the original main part of the bullet travels through the animal or through this ballistic gel. So all this information, if you look at it from a scientific perspective, but also as a hunter's perspective, it's kind of a sobering realization that lead in the eagles, uh, in Alaska's golden eagles, is coming from hunter's bullets. We can say that pretty conclusively. And of course, it's not only affecting uh, eagles, it's, it is being ingested by any animals that are scavenging on gut piles or meat that is trimmed closely um, to the channel of the bullet or for you know, uh, animals that are wounded and not recovered by hunters. So not only eagles are being affected, but surely anything that scavenges on those meat sources. Okay, well, so we, we can be pretty confident about where the lead's coming from, but how much lead is really needed to, to kill an eagle? How big of a deal is it? This was actually answered over 40 years ago with an experimental study where they fed lead to bald eagles that were not able to breed. Uh, and they found that uh, as little as 20 milligrams of lead, if it's simulated by a, a bald eagle, uh, killed that eagle. So anywhere from 20 to 130 milligrams of lead killed all the captive eagles in the study. Uh, to put that in layperson's terms, that's one tenth of the weight of a paperclip. So we're not talking about a lot of lead. In hunting terms, of course, bullets are weighting grains. So one grain is equivalent to 70 milligrams. So a standard 150 grain bullet, which is used for a lot of large game animals, weighs about, a, about 9,700 milligrams. So looking conservatively at, I'm sorry, liberally at a lethal dose of about 100 milligrams of lead, anywhere, basically about one one hundredth of 150 grain bullet, if assimilated by an eagle is enough to kill that eagle. In other words, a piece of lead smaller than a grain of rice. So we're talking about a really small piece of lead, if assimilated by the eagle, uh, can and will kill that eagle. And again, we know that lead bullets fragment a lot, and they're designed to do that, to rapidly kill an animal. So when we harvest an animal with a lead bullet, we know that we're producing lots of these small lead fragments. Now, there's a simple technical solution, and that's to use non-lead bullets. Um, copper bullets are extremely effective. They have high weight retentions. And as seen in this x-ray of another ballistic gel, um, they basically don't leave behind them a you know, trail of metal flex. And if they do leave any uh, metal in the animal, uh, it's copper, which is not nearly as toxic as lead. So while there's a simple technical solution, anytime that we deal with humans, um, it's not always that simple. And as a hunter, like 
traditions are really meaningful and important. And this is a photo of my two sisters and I in front of that same deer. Um, and for those of you that come from a, a hunting background and uh, especially a family, you know, family of hunters, uh, those traditions are, are really important to you and they're kind of hard to let go of. And I grew up using ammunition from a certain box of ammunition and it was always green and yellow and it was cheap uh, core lock uh, bullets. And that's just what I've always associated growing up as a child with hunting. Uh, and though I had changed to copper almost 20 years ago when I came to Alaska, um, I had an opportunity to go back to Wisconsin and use my dad's gun and harvest a deer really similar to that buck that he shot in 1982 that I still have these vivid memories of. And, uh, and this was a really meaningful moment for me as a hunter, uh, a connection to my father. And because I got it a little lazy and I wanted to use his gun and not reset it in, I just used the bullets we've always used, that same box of yellow and green. And it's just something that I, you know, I've always done as a kid. And so that's what I did. Uh, I had a really wonderful hunt, had, just got lucky and harvested this beautiful deer. Um, and I was hunting on my friend's property and I just did what they always did. And they dragged the deers down to the, to the uh, edge of the farm field. This is back in Wisconsin, got it and, and put it in a truck and take it away. And that experience really soured for me the next morning when I went back out and on the very gut pile that I removed from that deer that I shot with my dad's gun with lead ammunition, I watched a pair of adult bald eagles eating off of the gut pile. And the hunter in me and the biologist in me knew exactly what I was feeding those eagles. And I fed those eagles lead. I don't know if it killed the eagles. I don't know how much lead they ingested. Uh, they certainly had a spike in the blood lead levels. And I certainly didn't help them out. Um, and from that point on, it really convinced me like, no, never again am I ever using lead ammunition. A uh, personal decision that I made, um, uh, it was kind of a painful morning to see that as a, as a raptor biologist and just a hunter who enjoys seeing other animals in the woods. And so then I made the permanent switch to copper. And like I said, I've been hunting with copper uh, in Alaska for 20 years. And lots of you, I think, on here do the same. And they're it's wonderful bullets, highly effective. Um, and it's a really great opportunity option to go into the field, harvest an animal, and not have any guilt about what you might be leaving behind in the woods. Now, I certainly didn't come here to preach at all. One of the beautiful things about hunting, in my mind, is that there's no audience, typically. You're out there in the wild, and your decisions are really only available to you and maybe a hunting partner. Um, and you have to live with the decisions that you make. No one else is really going to see those. And there's lots of different ethics when it comes to hunting and behaviors, but I think most of the hunters that I know, uh, the ethical hunters, follow something along the lines of one shot, one kill. We want to take the animal that we're, you know, focused on quickly, humanely, and we're not interested in taking additional animals. Um, you want to take the one animal that's in, in your sights of your rifle. I think it's important that we as hunters recognize that if we use lead bullets, wildlife is likely ingesting them. And some of them are likely becoming poisoned by it, including golden eagles and many other scavengers. So I wanted to share with you tonight that quick uh, overview of the issue and then also my personal uh, experience with it. Uh, thank you for your time. And I would be happy to answer any questions if there are any.